Well, hello, everybody. On behalf of the Eileen Fisher Foundation and Pentatonic, a warm welcome to all who are joining us for our second episode in this series of five dialogues addressing the global textile waste crisis. I'm Amy Hall, Sustainability Strategic Advisor for the Eileen Fisher Foundation. And today's topic is reframing waste. Who owns textile waste? We recently partnered with design and technology consultancy Pentatonic to create the Hay Fashion Report um, and the website and now the webinar series. And our hope is that these resources together inspire you to take action and address textile waste head on. We know that even if one company hits all of its sustainability goals, it's only a drop in the bucket. This is why we strongly advocate for a system-wide or collaborative approach to addressing sustainability in the fashion industry. Please use this forum as an opportunity to connect with like-minded colleagues and begin dialogues of your own. We've chosen a few topics from the Hay Fashion Report to dive into and to give us an opportunity to come together as a global community and begin to see and sense into the possibilities. But before we start, I invite you to take a moment and respond to the Zoom poll um, that will show up on your screen right there. Which region of the world are you joining us from today? Um, I also invite you to, um, as we're beginning the program, to put in the chat your name, where you're joining us from, um, your affiliation, just so we get a sense of who's in the audience and, and people can see you and perhaps connect with you. This week's session will be connected, will be moderated by Antoinette Klatsky, Vice President of Programs and Partnerships at the Eileen Fisher Foundation. She'll be taking us through a dialogue process that invites us not just to be passive listeners and hearing about the problem, but to engage with each other through discussion and dialogue. Um, over to you, Antoinette, to introduce today's topic and catch up on the Zoom poll and introduce our speakers. Thanks, Amy. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Antoinette and uh, glad to be here with all of you. I'm just checking out the Zoom poll. Um, as you type in your little hellos and where you're coming from. It looks like we are um, in North America, Europe, and Asia today. Um, and it's really lovely to just sort at, figure out where we are all coming from. Also, because as we um, continue to build these dialogues and improve upon them, um, we know that we would like to be having this conversation with all areas who are both causing but causing issues and affected by the issues um, here. So we know um, that a lot of um, what is being created potentially in terms of waste and in terms of the crisis is, um, you know, perhaps coming from Europe and North America and landing in uh, in other areas. So um, just being aware of that as we come in and it's just wonderful to, to hear where we're all coming from and to know um, in each dialogue a little bit more about all of our places. Also recognizing that as we come in here um, to this Zoom room that we're representing different places around the world. So I love seeing um, where we're coming in from more specifically. I see Cam um, Cambodia, India, Las Vegas, Nevada, um, Ireland, Bulgaria, Baltimore, Maryland. So we really are coming in from all over for this conversation. Um, and I see London, Washington, DC, San Diego. Wonderful. So there's just really, um, you know, it's, it's a diverse conversation. We know that we're coming from a number of different perspectives. Um, and thank you for, for taking part in our poll and for joining us today. So a warm welcome to Hey Fashion a platform for inspiring, insightful, and provocative talks, which is brought to you by both the Eileen Fisher Foundation and Pentatonic, Pentatonic Global Leaders in the Circular Economy. And before getting into the schedule for the day, I'd like to just remind you about some of the logistics of the event. Um, Amy just invited you to share your questions, comments in the chat where you're coming from throughout the dialogue. You can feel free to share in the chat. Amy will be connecting in um, and Karen also um, from the Eileen Fisher Foundation will be handling any technical functions. So if you're, if you're um, struggling with anything, feel free to connect in with Karen and um, Amy will be, uh, 
chatting back in the in the chat um, and also collecting questions so that we can have them for our Q&A process at the end. Um, and we have guests joining us from all across the world. Um, so wherever, whatever time it is, wherever you may be, we have one thing in common. The time is now and our time is now. Our focus is singular. What can the fashion industry do to address and solve its global waste crisis? From too much product and insatiable consumption to the impact of, a, of synthetics and the industry's poor scorecard for waste, our panelists will dig deep and bring more ideas, solutions, and actions to the surface to present a more hopeful, sustainable future. So this is the second, as Amy mentioned, of five free online events with some of the industry's most progressive um, minds and activist leaders, all of which you can watch, share, and engage with on any of the Hay Fashion social channels. Um, and so I'm really just thrilled to welcome our speakers today, um, Carla Magruder, Nin Castle, and Kathleen Talbot, who we will be discussing reframing waste um, and really thinking about how as brands are starting to take ownership of their waste streams and sorters are remodeling their businesses, um, recyclers are seeking affordable feedstock and consumers are largely uninvolved. And we're wondering where does the responsibility lie? Um, so we are uh, so grateful to our speakers for joining us. We have Carla Magruder, who is a founder and president of Accelerating Circularity. She has over 35 years of global experience from fiber to finished garments. In her current role at Accelerating Circularity, she leads the organization's work in enabling the industry's transition to textile to textile circular systems. Prior to her current role, she founded Fabricology International, a textile consulting company where she worked on material developments and guided both nonprofit and for-profit organizations towards more sustainable textile strategies. Past clients include Textile Exchange, USAID, Lensing, and Carhartt. Her previous industry affiliations include the UNFCCC Fashion Industry Charter Steering Committee and co-chair of their Raw Material Working Group. And she's currently a member of Textile Exchange's Governance Board, the Walmart Lighthouse Advisory Board, and Green Ad Advisory Board. Um, so we're so glad to have you here with us. Carla and um, you know being able to share from your various uh, streams of experience. I'll just introduce our other two speakers and I'll turn it over to you, Carla to kick us off. Um, but Nin Castle is the co-founder of Reverse Resources, a SaaS platform for the fashion industry that enables mapping, matchmaking, and tracking of textile waste from source to recycling, closing the loop of material flows. With extensive experience in working with pre-consumer and post-industrial textile waste since 2006, NIN runs RR's international programs collaborating with NGOs, brands, manufacturers, waste handlers, and recyclers across Europe, Asia, and North Africa. Finally, NIN leads the Reverse Resources Recyclers Network, matching textile waste streams with the best possible recycling solutions. Um, so really grateful to have your expertise here, NIN, as well. And finally, Kathleen is joining us. Kathleen Talbot is the Chief Sustainability Officer and VP of Operations at Reformation, the revolutionary lifestyle brand that proves fashion and sustainability can coexist. Kathleen joined Reformation in 2014 to build a sustainable and scalable supply chain and a framework for incorporating sustainability into all business practices. Today, Kathleen spearheads Reformation's industry-leading sustainability initiatives across the brand's global supply chain, including their commitment to becoming climate positive by 2025, and additionally oversees Reformation's factory operations and the customer love team. Love to hear more about that as well. Um, Kathleen also works on customer-facing campaigns and services to, re to raise awareness around the impact fashion has on people and planet and to offer easy, impactful solutions. So that's exactly what we need to this uh, waste problem. So really glad to have you here with us, Kathleen, um, especially as we focus on um, the needs that we have to really look at post-industrial, pre-consumer, post-consumer waste, um, and, and all the needs for, for the connections across those systems. So thank you, Amy, for putting those links in the chat. Um, and welcome to our, our speakers. Thank you again for being with us. And Carla, I'd like to turn it over to you, um, maybe to just open us up on 
um, the current situation and and your you know thinking about textile waste from your vantage point. So over to you, Carla. Sure. Thanks so much. I'm very happy to be here. Um, the first thing, though, that I would say is at Accelerating Circularity, um, our mission says that we're you know working on building new business models and circular systems to transform spent textiles. We don't like the word waste textiles. Um, you know, wasted materials, just because we don't want it to be waste. We don't want to think about it in those terms, right? And to transform those spent textiles into mainstream warm materials to the point um, for Kathleen, this has to happen at scale. And so when we're talking about, you know, what is the situation of the market today? I think it's really clear that we have to think about it where those spent materials are, right? There's post-industrial, which um, Nin is the, you know, probably has more information on than anybody else. There's unsold goods, and we have to think about those. About 30% of goods that are made in the world today aren't actually sold and find a home. And then we've got to look at post-consumer. And post-consumer, I see numbers that go, you know, I was using 90 million tons a year that's globally. I was at a conference not too long ago. The numbers that were being used there by people who have a tremendous amount of experience we're somewhere around 100 million tons a year, 100 million tons a year. We only make about 100 and 120 uh, million tons a year only. Um, but so we're throwing out just about as much as we make every year, right? Those are huge numbers. So when you start to think about who owns this, these materials, the spent textiles, it's really going to depend on a number of things, which of one of those three products is it? And what is the system that they have developed those materials in, right? So if we're talking about post-industrial materials, if it's at the factory and you know the brand has ordered a finished garment, it's a different thing than if the brand ordered fabric. Um, unsold goods are generally pretty clear who owns that. Um, material. And then post-consumer textiles, I mean, that's going to be a very interesting thing as we move into the marketplace and we start thinking about digital IDs. You know, I've heard people reference, well, you know, if the brand has a digital ID on it and can get it back, then the brand can own that. Well, you know, I think all of these things are really important for us to understand and think about what it means when we get into the details. And if I could say anything about today's market and our move towards circularity is that we as an industry need to really get into and understand the details because that's where, so to speak, the action is, right? The more that you learn about the details, the more you understand and have the ability to change. Um, you know, Nan's, Nan's coming next, which is great. And, you know, we talk about the need for us to collaborate, which we have to do across all of these areas, right? You know, when we talk about the brand, we talk about the sorters, we talk about the consumers, we talk about the collectors. All of these people have to collaborate. It's not like, you know, the collaboration only has to happen in one place. It needs to happen in all places. And Accelerating Circularity and Reverse Resources collaborate today on you know, who the recyclers are, how do we get post-consumer up onto their platform as well as um, you know, post-industrial. So I think probably now is a good time for me to transfer over to Nin. Thanks, Carla. Um, I suppose adding on from what Carla would say, um, for us, it's all about efficient supply chains and how do we create this infrastructure to organized textile waste whether and i and i agree with you carla completely when we first started up we used to call all waste leftovers um in search for another word and um because again waste isn't it shouldn't be waste it should be recycled and also what is waste sometimes you refer to a textile as a waste where actually it already has a use case it might not be the best use case but it is currently going into some um other use afterwards so really that's not a waste um so it's a it's in itself is a problematic term that unfortunately I've, I've i've sunk into using far too much um but what i what i really wanted to talk about was how 
for me and for reverse resources especially it's it's about having these efficient supply chains how do we collect organize and categorize textile waste and if some of those supply chain barriers can be solved by a brand owning that waste by a manufacturer owning that waste by a um you know a consumer owning that waste then we're all for it what does strike us as an issue in the future or could be a big issue is um is a monopoly if a lot of large brands start declaring ownership of their waste and monopolizing sort of the fiber that's you know in continuous circulation then that is something that we are already discussing internally um, within our platform how we can make sure that we and always encourage people to start getting the recycling systems going and if that is by a brand saying I want to declare ownership of that and it makes them responsible for that textile waste and makes them make sure it gets recycled then today that's a really good thing but what are the long-term issues of that is something that we really like Carla was saying the details of it that needs to be continually uh, assessed but for me right now it's efficiency 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 and getting this big ball rolling um and we're gonna have a a learning curve as it starts accelerating um hopefully in the coming years as some of these larger uh chemical recycling plants and scaling mechanical recycling companies are really recycling more and more textile have i got can you hear me i've got very bad connection we can hear you well uh, the image okay. may have gone in and out a little bit but we definitely got the the message thanks nin um, and maybe we turn it over to Kathleen. Great. Well, I'm already um, I'm already inspired. I'm already um, prompted so much by by the comments that Carla and Anne have made. And I think, you know, what we all share in common probably is this commitment to reframing waste to begin with, right? Um, from a brand perspective, it's so interesting because I think where we have the most influence is, is really front of the funnel to start, right? How do we actually plan and merchandise smarter, um, more efficiently? And, and to, to, to piggyback on Carla's comment, create less of that liability, less of those unsold goods to begin with. Um, in, in my mind, when we think about designing out waste, it's not just that product development side. It, it's really, it starts in, in the planning and merchandising. And I think that that's something that's been really core of um, the sustainability and impact work at Reformation um, from our founding and, and something that you know, none of us are perfect. Uh, we're all doing our best to use technology and tools to do this better. Um, but this is also one of those things that hopefully is the least controversial, right? It's a win-win, it's better business, and it's and it's a way to reduce um, a pretty significant amount of um, textile waste out of the system. Um, so I think that that's something that, you know, again, it's really that call to action for brands and something we should, we should where we have to start. Um, probably not alone in this group, but you also think about like, where do you put the least amount of effort to get the most impact? And, and that seems like the, the obvious obvious place to start from a brand. Um, the second is really thinking about um, uh, how we can work with our suppliers um, to manage their raw materials liabilities, AKA sometimes ends up waste, uh, uh, and, and also that, that post-industrial um, scrap um, and, and salvage. So that's been something from a brand perspective, that's been really fun, um, really exciting to figure out where do we have the, the partners that have that same interest and the capabilities to start to collect and sort that, um, from a complexity perspective, again, frankly, a lot easier than trying to do post-consumer. Um, so we are, um, really trying to figure out how we build that network and create some of that regionalization within, um, our, our tier one manufacturing partners and, and some of our, our mill partners that have recycling capabilities and, and, um, can, can bring some of that, um, still early for us. And I imagine some of the other brands that are, that are, have similar programs in place, but we did, um, our first kind of circular denim, uh, uh, collection earlier this year, um, directly routing some of our manufacturing waste um, back into our, our, our denim fabrication, recycled denim fabrication. So it's one of those things, again, that I think is um, imperative for brands to influence. Um, if we continue to work with our suppliers, build the partnership, and frankly, 
show some of those demand signals that we were interested in in closing that loop and, and working on um, maximizing recycled content. Hopefully we can start to again, bring those things to scale. Um, and then I think the last is, is really this idea and, and Carla mentioned it already, um, but are brands and should brands be accountable for their products at the end of their use phase at the, once, once the consumers are done wearing them. And I think when you hear a lot of the circularity stories in, in press right now, you see the headlines, the things that are splashy, that's really where brands seem to be showing up, right? They're going to help facilitate resale programs to, to extend the life and the durability of their stuff. Um, and, and a few of us are, are, are trying to figure out how we actually get our product back from customers when it can't be resold. Um, and I think, you know, Patagonia is an example of a brand that's been doing this for, for many years. Reformation's done this for probably the last seven. Um, and we just relaunched a, a program um, called Ref Recycling to, to try to at least give an option to get our products back from, from um, customers when they're done wearing them. Um, and this is frankly where I think we, it's hard, you know, again, I think brands have a role to play. You're talking again, who owns this, who should be responsible. This is a pure cost center right now. Um, this is something that, um, I, I love Nin. I, I, I can't wait until we have to have the conversation about, is this a problem and can, or will this become a monopoly or, or, or an issue? Because right now, um, these things still are in the balance sheet waste. And a, and a cost center, right? They, they don't have the value of the feedstock and of the next generation material yet. And so I think that this is where, again, frankly, I, I don't think I have the answers, but I know directionally, this is where we need to do some work and we need to work together to understand what's the role of industry and broader system infrastructure and the brands that play their part. And if we can start to have these really rich conversations around, you know, uh, product responsibility and 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 some of these things. I, I really I feel hopeful that will make more traction and make more ground in this really important part of the the the, the total textile waste system. Sorry, that was a lot. I tried to cover. I tried to cover all of the network the network. <laughs> It's fantastic, actually. I mean, I think all of these different vantage points give us a really clear picture. And, um, you know, we can dive further into the discussion here. Um, and thanks, Amy, for, for putting in some notes for us, too, to just keep the conversation going. Um, and, you know, really just thinking about this piece about kind of formalizing the sector, even as you just said, you know, if, if this is a pure cost center, um, you know, how do we look at the value of waste, you know, so as we, I'm thinking about both of those things, how do we kind of formalize this sector or how do we kind of give value to waste or, you know, what, what are you all seeing? Um, and, and oh, I'm chomping on this one. So, <laughs> so I, I would, um, like to pose a bit of a different perspective, right? So the brands <laughs> have, yeah, I mean, this is my job and I have fun doing it. Um, so, you know, the brands want to have these take back programs, right? And it is a cost center. And um, what we have, you know, when in the work that we do, right, is trying to build the system at accelerating circularity. How do we put all the pieces together so the system actually could work? And what we have constantly is brands coming to us and saying, we have this collection program, we've gone to a recycler and we say we have all of this material and they feel like they have a relatively large volume of material. And the recycler says, sorry, I can't take it. And, and we hear that story over and over again. On the flip side of that, I have collectors come to me and say, you know, the brands want me to manage their take back program and it's expensive, right? You've got to, they've got to pay for it. The goods have to be sorted. Certainly there is some income for what gets resold, which is how, how the collectors normally make their money. Their primary money is made on what gets sorted out and could be resold, right? That has the highest value. As a matter of fact, You've got your highest value from um, sort collectors to sort for resale domestically. Then there's um, the collectors sort for resale internationally, and they get paid less for that. And then there are additional grades. And what's going to happen in my world, in my mind, what's going to happen is that that will continue. And then, then 
the grade that it's the grades that are left over today are going into things like shoddy and insulation and wipers and you know some of it's going to landfill and, and incineration. Now what happens is after they segment out those materials that can go into resale, they can look at those with a, a, a more um, careful eye and say, okay, this is 100% cotton, this is 100% polyester, these are blends that I can still work with, it's not a blend that's sort of outside of recyclers ranges, and then they can aggregate those, right, so that there's enough, because one of the things that we haven't mentioned yet that's incredibly important for this whole circular system is the ability of the materials to flow to the places that they need to be in the quantities that they need so that the system can work and can commercialize, right? And that's huge. I mean, I think in the beginning, Amy said something, um, I think it was Amy that said something about, you know, we in the US, Europe, um, and the UK, we're generators of all this spent textiles, right? We manufacture goods in the East. And then what we do when we have goods that we want to then um, throw away, we then ship those to a third part of the world, right? So the flow of materials today is at odds with what we need to do with it, right? Some of those countries were, that are getting some of these um, secondhand materials don't have the capacity to do sorting and recycling, um, and it leads to some problems. So it's really, really important that we let the people who have the skill and the capacity to sort, collect, sort, aggregate, and then most importantly, we still have to find this because it's, it's, this is to me the critical juncture, pre-process those items that are coming back, they can then go to a, a, a recycler. So, you know, from the post-consumer aspect, we've got to look at it that way. And there are for-profit collectors and people have been doing this for the, you know, the business has been doing it for generations. We have people like Goodwill who've been doing it for hundreds of years and they collect 9 billion garments a year just in the United States. So there are, we have to take these sections of the industry that we haven't sort of acknowledged before. They're not the pretty part of the industry, right? They're not the cool and groovy clothes, but they're an integral part of the industry. And how do we work with them so that we can move into new systems, but building off of what's already there rather than trying to make something entirely new. You know, we're trying to turn around like a train. They don't do that easily. So let's work with what we've got. I just want to plus one on Carla. Um, I, and I want to quickly clarify one of the things that we wanted to do through our reimagination of Rough Recycling this year was exactly that. How do we connect back into a multi-brand platform and a, a system player who can do that sorting, aggregating in some level that pre-processing, because I think that that's been one of the missing links. To Carla's point, there's been players in the background, right? But not always connecting with the, the brands or retailers um, directly. And so um, I think that that is one of the potential unlocks. Um, one of the things we talked about is some of these early um, early kind of leading brands that, that have been doing this work for, let's call it the last five to 10 years. Um, they're still sitting on containers of stuff that they're getting, you know, onesies and twosies back from con consumers, and they're never going to meet meet those um, those volume demands and 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 what the recyclers need at, at scale. And we saw that that situation, right? That is our current state, um, and said that's not going to be helpful to cover this point. You're not going to actually get that material back into the system. Um, and so I, you know, quick plug for Super Circle, but there's other there's other um, providers that are, are coming out of the woodwork in the last few years to say, how can they be that that connector and, and that link between this um, commitment or desire of brands and retailers to take that accountability to, to actually be the nexus with the customer? You know, we have more or less the direct link to the consumer. Um, so how do we educate, inspire encourage, I saw some of the notes in the chat, even incentivize people to send us stuff back um, and then and then make those connections and, and actually ensure that this stuff goes back into the fashion system and, and gets connected to this um, network. Um, so just wanted to quickly clarify and, and plus one to Carla's comments, because I think that's, that's so critical if we, we really do want to make change and not just have a marketing effort. Lynn, did you want to come in? 
so you can yeah hear you. i mean um yeah kathleen i mean this is um i never heard of super cycle i'm gonna look them up but this is exactly what reverse resources what we've um why we set ourselves up was to be a sort of a data source and to create visibility of waste and where it is um so that we can begin to serve and of this growing uh, recycling industry and we're working with a number of the um you know we've pretty much got most of the large chemical recycling companies on a platform we're working with a lot of the leading uh, uh, mechanical recyclers and they all need waste so it's a bit of what we see in our daily work is this um this disconnect we have we probably have like two thousand tons a month of order from our current recycling network and we can't supply that from our um from our sort of supply uh network because when we're working is we work very much with only um with post-consumer waste that can be fiber scanned because of our motivation as a as a platform is to provide visibility and assurance of the quality of the waste so contamination is something that we're constantly trying to reduce and to keep that textile as clean as it possibly can so it arrives at the right specification for the recyclers um, so on one side we have so many recyclers saying please please find me more of this waste and the other side we see a lot of waste but it's all in um you know in disarray um with the post-consumer waste we have now the um, fiber scanning technologies emerging on the scene, which is fantastic. And this is really why we at Reverse Resources have only started working with post-consumer waste this year, because it's only literally been in the past year or you know 18 months that these fiber scanning technologies have really been out on the market in little pockets, but just there. So that you can say, yes, we can assure that this, this, you know, 20 tons is this exact specification with a two, 3%, um, you know, uh, variation rate or contamination rate. Um, we've been working a lot with post-industrial waste because when we first set up back in 2015, um, it was the low hanging fruit. Essentially the factory knows what that waste is. Um, so we spent a lot of time training factories on really basic, we say like, improved waste handling and segregation practices, which sounds very fancy, but actually it's really simple. It's not complicated. You know, if you're a garment manufacturer, it's literally when you have a fabric on the cutting table, try and cut just one fabric at a time. Um, and then when you have that fabric, just don't put it on the floor and into a bin, just put it straight from the table into a bin. And when that bin is, when your fabric is finished, you, you close the bin you close the bag even if it's half empty that is improved waste handling and segregation practices and then you put a label to say what that fabric is it's so simple but just that small process change at the factory has huge benefits further down the line for the recycler because of typically what happens in the factories is all the textile waste gets mixed together and then it's just bagged up and sold out as cheap cheap and fast i mean it really varies. Some countries, you know, like in India, they actually in quite a lot for their textile waste. Other countries in like North Africa, you see um, factories paying for a company to come and pick up their textile waste. So um, the value of textile waste uh, varies dramatically per country. But essentially, the waste handlers will come and pick up this mixed bag, and then they have to segregate by touch and by burn, which is not the most efficient way of segregation. Um, especially for chemical recyclers, for mechanical recyclers, if it's 100% cotton, most of it, and it's got a little bit of polyester, a little bit of something, they can more or less work with it. But some of the chemical recyclers, if it has elastane, that is a huge issue for them, or they can handle elastane, but if it's got a lot of polyester, then that's a huge, a huge issue for them. So what was okay is now not all right. And there needs to be so much more um, work done by the industry and also by brands to 
set up these waste handling and segregation practices at manufacturer level, because that is like a huge kickstart into creating these cleaner waste flows and also to be able to identify what waste is where so you can accumulate sufficient volumes. Because as Carla was saying, you've got so many, I've got a ton, I've got 750 kilograms or I've got three tons or whatever it is, but a recycler needs a 20, 25 ton container of one specific textile and sometimes of one specific color of one specific textile. So you really need to aggregate this, you know, um, together. And the waste handlers here perform a very important service and uh, are very important players as part of this system. However, with the waste handlers, you know, they're often working at varying leaves, levels of informalities um, some maybe just not maybe having mm, the correct licenses to really high levels of corruption. Um, and this whole waste handling sector really needs a lot of work to really enable them to provide the services that we need. And compliance in this sector is a huge issue. And sometimes I feel like there's very few companies talking about compliance in the waste handling sector. I don't feel there's enough compliant waste handlers today to fulfill the needs of recyclers, um, let alone the supply that we will need in the future. Um, and we talk about inclusivity a lot as a word that get, gets used within the circular economy. And that is the inclusivity section, you know, how to really improve the working conditions um, and, you know, that, supply chain is going to be a huge but really beneficial uh, thing to do. Thanks, Nin. Um, it, you know, there's a lot that comes up for me there. And I'm curious, just based on where we are, Carla and Kathleen, um, what's coming up for you? And then I have a few more questions um, before we turn to further dialogue altogether. Yeah, uh, you know, from from, for us at Accelerating Circularity, you know, what we're really trying to do is to model what we've modeled and then to pilot, you know, can you actually do these things with what materials can you do them, right? And so we worked with reverse resources to, you know, help identify materials. And we look at materials very clearly because while we want to, you know, sort of the charter for what we're doing is textile to textile, using sort of with a focus on post-consumer. Post-consumer, as, as everybody has said here today, is the most difficult, right? We, we actually call it material from the wild. And, you know, if you think about it, every single piece that comes in, even if, you know, you sort it, according to some specification that you know will meet a uh, recycler's need. So for instance, if you sort, you know, to very high content cotton and it's a jersey, because that's different, right? Than sorting to something that's very high content cotton and is a woven, right? Different recyclers can do that. One of the things that we did at Accelerating Circularity is we created these matrices that looked at, you know, different fiber blends, which kind of recycler can handle that? What are the restrictions based on different kinds of recyclers? you know, mechanical, chemical, cotton, polyester. There needs to be different grades for different types of recyclers. And then, you know, if you've got post-consumer, absolutely the hardest. Unsold goods, they're sort of in the middle, right? Because you know typically what fabric it is. You know that it meets um, RSLs, you know, things that come from post-consumers you don't know, you have to test it from RSL. Is it meeting RSLs? Um, and, and if it does this time, this batch, it might not do it next batch because next batch is gonna be entirely different. And then you think about post-industrial goods, you know, to Nin's point, it's in a factory, if they can keep these things separated, you know, we jokingly call that pablum, right? It's baby food for the recycling industry. Everybody knows how to use it. You know what's in it. It's easier to use. So we've got to take, and if we want to make these changes, we've got to take and do the experiments with what is possible today, get it moving, get that baby through food through the system. Maybe, you know, what we're doing at Accelerating Circularity is we've created what we call the ACP blend. It's 20, it's 50% post-industrial material, 50% post-consumer. And we've taken that blend 
in 100% cotton or as close to 100% cotton using those things as we can. And then we're now blending it with virgin cotton. We're blending it with things like Refibra. We're blending it with um, uh, post, um, post consumer mechanically recycled polyester, thermal mechanically recycled polyester, right? So we're constantly trying to up the post consumer input. I mean, I think Kathleen, you talked about the most, you know, trying to get as much recycled material in something. So you have to do that based on what's possible with the technologies that we have today. And that's a critically important thing to creating the demand and getting things moving. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just like Carla. I could. We need to have a lot more conversations, um, and maybe that aren't always recorded. But um, this is just so so much of this resonates. Um, and we're I, all so passionate about this, right? I know, right? This is well, clearly we're all we're all geeking out about this, thinking about this, and these are hard problems. I think that's what I that this conversation also is highlighting again for me. Like we're dealing with something that is complex. Um, we're all trying to take a systemic approach. We're all trying to think about how we get the right players and the right stakeholders engaged at each of these levels within the supply chain and, and, and frankly, within commerce, right? This stuff is, 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 is complex. But I think if I had to, to summarize it too, one of the things that has been helpful for us internally when we're talking about our role, and again, what, what, what role should a brand play, is this idea that it does start with making sure our products are circular ready. So Nin, I think you, you kind of touched on this, Carly, you've, you've touched on this too. Um, if you're not thinking at all about what you can do with it after, or if it's going to start to, 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 to um, be able to, to, to plug into some of these post-consumer um, flows, then we're not doing it. We're not doing our job. And so, you know, one of the things we've been talking about is for our clothes to stick around, they need to be made from durable quality, non-toxic materials. They have to be designed with that recyclability in mind. And then we need to maximize the sourcing of recycled and non-virgin or next generation fibers. And at one of the things we've been talking about internally is we, we say that's on us, right? That's a hundred percent brand. Those are brand decisions. Those are product choices. We have the control of doing, of doing that and setting that up. The second piece is about really consumers buying less, better stuff. We are asking them to care for their stuff responsibly. We're asking them to say buy wisely meaning repairing, reselling, and then recycling. And while that's on the consumer, we also have a role to educate, engage, and have the right programs in place to help, right? And I think there's been some really helpful and, and productive conversations in the chat to say, is it really, should all these brand, brand, brands be setting up their own programs? Long-term, no, right? We, we want there to be a, an actual system solution, but in the meantime, what do we do to facilitate those activities? And how do we start to create that as a norm instead of, that true linear, you trash, you trash it when you're done with it model. And then I think the last is, is really what we've, we've, but we've all been touching on, right? We have to link up with the right partners. We need to be investing in fiber recycling capabilities, the infrastructure, and frankly, even the impact reporting. A lot of this stuff is like black box still. So the reality is that this stuff's not going to get done voluntarily. So I also like to give a plug for regulation. You know, some of this will have to start to, to, to come into the mainstream. And, and I think that's going to take the whole industry. Um, but again, brands like Reformation, hopefully we can commit to lead the way, right? Continue to investing in some of these things, advocating for these things, be on the right side of lobbying for, for some of these policies and, and, and try to accelerate, accelerate the change we know is necessary within the industry. That's my, Thanks, that's my soapbox. <laughs> I love it. Um, I think, you know, this is fantastic. And I feel like, you know, we're just, as you started to say, we're just kind of scratching the surface of the conversation here. So um, we're at the moment where we'd like to um, shift the kind of way we're having this dialogue. So the speakers will also join um, our breakout rooms, but we're going to turn to each other in, in small groups to, to just continue the dialogue. There's so much, the chat is on fire. Um, and really, we know that a lot of the solutions, we're hearing a lot of them, but a lot of the solutions already live in this room um, to the problems that we're seeing. So we're going to turn to each other, then we're going to come back for further um, conversation with Q&A directly um, with our speakers, and, um, and then we'll close up at the 
um, 11.30 Eastern time. So as we turn to each other, really um, sitting with what, what is touching you from this conversation, what solutions are you already seeing? And feel free to introduce yourself and a uh, reminder that, um, you know, really listening to each other, giving, giving each other enough time to, to share a little bit. So introduce yourself, share where you're coming from, um, what's staying with you with, for, with um, what you just heard from our speakers and what questions do you have now? Um, and we'll post those questions in the chat. You'll have just about 12 minutes to connect with each other and then we'll be back um, in the large room. So see you all in about 12 minutes. Okay, I think we're all back. Welcome back, everyone. We'd love to both hear about your breakouts, but really use them as a space to hear more about what came up regarding your questions. I love seeing everybody's faces. I just went on gallery view and it was very exciting. I feel like um, all the right people are in the room and, and we've got this, go team. Um, so Amy is um, has been checking out what's been coming up in the chat, but feel free to type in, um, your questions that you might have for our speakers now and i'll turn it over to amy to share some of those questions that have been coming up yeah um there were a couple of comments during the i'll just start before i see new questions coming up from your room from your conversation just now a couple comments during the conversation that had to do with policy and um i'm so i'm curious about if somebody would be willing to expand a little bit on how they see the role of policy influencing the future of waste, textile waste. And um, Kristen in particular had a question about any, are there any trade associations or nonprofits leading the way on advocacy that you might turn to? So sort of a two-sided policy question. Who'd like to jump in? I, I can, um, a policy is essential. And actually, probably Nin has a lot to say because she's from the, from Europe or UK, actually close enough. She lives in France um, that they're way ahead of the United States. And but there are things happening in the United States, right? There, there is some work being done. Um, actually, next week I'll be in the city for USFIA. They're very, you know, aware of what is or is not being done in the United States. California, um, the CPSC is doing some work. Um, Hold on, Carla. What are those organizations? USFIA in New York, they work with policy. Um, and then um, even AAFA, I know AAFA has been very involved in the whole um, support of digital identifiers in garments. Um, you know, CPSC in California is actually doing some waste characterization studies and have done some um, studies in terms of how much like post-industrial waste is available in California. In Europe, it's um, much broader because the European Commission actually has a whole, you know, uh, textile focused plan and policy. Um, there's an organization based out of the United, out of Europe called the Policy Hub that engages very closely with the European Commission on the policies that they are um, you know, trying to implement. And there are several different, um, you know, there's a European Commission and, and different organizations within the European um, government. Maybe Nin, you might have some more names that you can throw out there. Yeah, I see um, a lot of the companies that are used to lobbying can be quite useful, like the federations and associations. So in Europe, you see Eurotex doing a lot. Um, we also see in when we're working like in Bangladesh, then the BGMEA, which is Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers Export Association, you know, they have a big sway, but still really these organizations that sh should have a lot of sway really struggle. And my fear is that policy is just critical. It's I mean, we're never going to get this ball rolling without it because the numbers simply don't add up. It costs too much to logistically pay for petrol, which is, you know, not getting any cheaper. Um, electric vehicles also not very cheap. 
where are you going to get electricity to even you know charge them on um just the logistics of collecting these post-consumer wastes um from different locations then storing them let alone then fiber scanning them and bailing and all the other sort of things that you need to do and then preparing them and then chemical testing them and so on and so forth. Those different cost centers are just so much higher than the target buying price of, you know, recycling companies. Some mechanical recyclers can um, um, pay, the, pay that cost, but they struggle to get the quality and the volumes per, you know, enough of one particular color um, to mechanically recycle. So there's a dispersed waste uh, landscape that makes it really challenging for them. But the numbers, yeah, they just don't add up. And without some kind of subsidies or tax reforms to um, support companies who are doing these collections and these services and making them be profitable, it's, you're just not going to, the infrastructure is just not going to arrive. Um, and I don't know what the solution is. <laughs> you know, I, it's, I, I like to think back to a story that was actually um, told at a textile exchange conference many years ago um, in India. And they talked about the fact that for the paper industry to transition to where they are today, where all paper has recycled input in it, there was a mandate of X percent had to be in it. Now, I know that that's um, one of the um, potential um, areas of policy for the European Union. We don't have that here in the United States or there in the United States. Um, but the, you know, at Accelerating Circularity, we often talk about, you know, designing from recycling. You know, a lot of people want to talk about designing for recycling, you know, so that the goods can go back into recycling. But if we don't design from recycling, if we don't use those goods, we are not going to create the demand. I mean, Kathleen, you said something about that early on, right? So we need to be able to put in as much material into our product as possible that are recycled because it creates the demand. And as we create the demand, the systems will grow. And so having some kind of policy that says, hey, you have to have a certain percent in there. Um, you know, those kinds of things are happening in the plastics industry. So there are models and there are things that we should be looking at in terms of the kinds of policies that we're going to need for the textile industry. Um. So there are, uh, there's another follow-up question, but I wanted to note that a couple of people, including Kathleen, one of our speakers, posted some new um, legislation that's in effect here in the United States that I wasn't aware of. They're both state, well, one is state focused and one is county focused. Um, Raymond posted that Massachusetts starting today is banning landfilling textiles. That's very fortuitous and timely. And Kathleen posted that California just passed a bill to pilot textile recycling in Los Angeles and Ventura counties. So very interesting um, developments starting locally and perhaps hopefully picking up attention and steam from other states and perhaps eventually making their way to national policy level, I imagine. Um, I find that those two developments just very exciting. Um, maybe we'll catch up with Europe one day. Um, Alex has posted a question, how do we ensure that new policies regarding, for example, minimizing textile waste are effectively put into practice without having numerous exceptions that provide loopholes for market leading companies? This is always a challenge. Um, anyone wanna tackle that one? I know none of us is specifically a policy expert, but I think we're all involved in, in policy in some way. I'm not going to be the, the the policy wonk in the group by any means, Alex, but I think that I would just echo some of the things that Carla said, which is if we start designing um, from recycling, you start to add that valuation, right? These starts to be market demand signals. It's all the things Carla described. I think that that's where, where we know we need to go. And I think without policy, even imperfect policy, right? The, the, the first pass, we're not going to start to get that um, that engagement at scale, and we're going to continue to have the few front runners that are that are leading this and willing to 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 go before the the markets there. Um, and so, 
I would say too, like even imperfect policy at this point, we'll start to send some of the signals and start to put some of this in action. Um, and and I think that's what we're all saying we need, right? Is is progress and some of that that push. Um, to to get the conversation moving and to start to drive the right investment in the infrastructure and some of these other bigger systemic changes we've been we've been discussing this morning. Um, go ahead, Carla. You know, policy getting policy right is, in a sense, like I was saying earlier, we really need to understand the details. And the problem with getting policy right is so many people don't understand the details. Never mind the policymakers. And quite frankly, some people also in the industry, right? You don't understand really what happens in the details of things. And that's where um, when we want to engage in these things, we have to be really careful that we're, we're, we're understanding the details. We know how things are going to work on the ground and we're not going to make changes. Here's an example. You know, I've spoken with a collector and he's very concerned because people in Europe are saying that in Europe, they want to define what is a rewearable garment. And, you know, this guy ships garments all over the world. And he says one of the places he ships it to is Central America and Central America, you know, the guy that picks um, coffee beans for a living is pretty happy with a t-shirt he can buy for, you know, almost nothing. He wears it, he sweats in it, he makes it really dirty, even, you know, grimier than it is, but it's inexpensive and it covers him and protects him for the sun. It might already have a stain in it or rip in it. You know, the European Commission is saying that shouldn't be exported because, you know, they don't want it to end up in landfill in another country. So the complexity of this is staggering. It's really staggering. So we have to be so careful. Um, and make sure that we're including so many perspectives. I would add one thing to hear as well is I really agree with you, Kathleen, that it's best to be roughly right than exactly wrong. Otherwise, we end up just stagnating. And um, it was actually quite heartening when I sat in a meeting with a pretty big brand who was saying that to us, saying, look, we're now in this place where we just need to move um, and be roughly right and figure out um, which is good. The big issue for from my point of view is that the with legislation is that it can be quite stagnant. Um, and what is it's like how do you define waste because of waste in one location won't be waste in another location. And as these recycling technologies improve, something that they wouldn't be able to recycle, suddenly they will be able to recycle. So defining what waste is in accordance to its location is going to be hugely hugely challenging um, and could will also <laughs> only add to the intricacies of, leg of the legislation of that region. Um, because you might find in one country in the north, that recycling, that waste stream isn't a waste, it's actually a recycled feedstock. And in the south of that country, it's not possible to get it there logistically. So therefore, it is a waste. Um, yeah. So this is interesting because yeah. the comments are coming up on the side about, well, let's not forget about resale and and um, mm -hmm. and that so, uh, so much of our clothing is still wearable after we finished wearing it, right? And how do we um, how do we help consumers, you know, rethink their relationship to, to clothing? That's so, you know, the title of this um, whole session is something about how do we, who, who owns textile waste? And so we started out the session by talking, like everybody had their own definition or another word for the word for textile waste and not even wanting to use the word waste. And now we're talking about, well, how do we, how do we rethink waste altogether and, and involve the consumer? Because that's such a big part of this conversation. There's an organization called Refashion. Um, and the thing that's interesting about Refashion is they are an organization that was funded by the EPR scheme, the Extended Producer Responsibility Scheme in France. And it's probably the oldest, more ro most robust. So they have a tremendous amount of information on you know, what that means and what, that, what those dollars can be put towards you know, for improving um, what happened. So I, I, I think that that's really um, maybe a useful thing, Amy, when you're thinking about that. 
it also see- comes in for me yeah. is like to make the repair has to be a really important part of the resale because so much stuff is not resold because it needs to be repaired in some way and then it goes back to the policy question is is how are you going to make that re- local repair viable that doesn't then make that resale of that product too expensive and there needs to be some kind of um, support for you know those sort of dry cleaning companies that do those rep- basic repairs on your local high street they need to yeah have some support there to grow and be able to do more at a better price uh yeah i spoke with a guy yesterday who's having sort of a mobile repair and that he's going around and he's picking up the garments that need to be repaired then mm. repairing in a shop and then bring you know delivering them sort of like you know that um you know like a cleaning thing so it's very interesting um, there are people that are looking to develop these these systems. I was in a nudie shop the other day and I was really happy to see that they because I know they have these repair centers in their shop. And I was like, I wonder how successful it is. And I, I went to have a have, have a look around and when I was there, like three people turned up to pick up their jeans to be repaired. And they were busy and they had stacks of jeans that they were repairing. And it was kind of in central London so not a, an easy place like you're going out of your way to go there to drop it off and pick it up so it shows that there is an appetite for it yeah and I think that the, you know we we didn't talk explicitly about that this morning but I think we all are, are kind of following the same logic of, of the hierarchy right we want we want these materials um these garments to to have the the best use the highest value use and work its way down to to a recycling stream so i think hopefully that kind of goes with without saying and i know carla and then you've talked about a lot of that sortation happens right and you're pulling the stuff that actually can be rewearable including many different grades <laughs> um in in the process but i think from a brand perspective you know again this is where you see a lot of activity um because there frankly is a lot more solutions out there, whether you want to be pointing customers to -to peer-to-peer resale, if brands are doing their own white label resale platforms, you have the the, the big players in the US like ThreadUp or, you know, globally um, like Vestier. So, you know, I think I, I see this less as a concern of like, we don't have the solution. We have the solution for some of these things. I also am a big fan of this idea of localization, you know, I don't think we sh- as a brand should be collecting everybody's needs for repairs and centralizing them into one city or one market. How do we start to test models to, to facilitate, you can still maybe take responsibility um, to, to, to facilitate repairs, but, but not be shipping stuff all across the country and the, and the globe again. Um, so I think this is something that feels um, frankly less daunting the solutions are there, the right partners are there. And again, brands definitely have a role in educating, um, facilitating some of this and frankly paying for some of the repairs um, and some of the, the handling that's required to, to make sure that our stuff stays in use longer um, and ultimately gets to some of these channels for, for resale. Um, boy, this this part of the conversation really lit up the chat and I'm like having trouble staying focused on both sides, but there's a lot of interest in um, in this idea of, of kind of beefing up repair services, engaging consumers. Um, somebody has specifically asked, Shipra has specifically asked Kathleen to hear more about uh, the reward model that I guess that Reformation offers. Um, and and if that's something that it does that work, is there something else that you'd like to see happen um, on the brand side down the road? Yeah, it's so interesting. I think that again, from um, the, our learnings on on kind of the business case for a resale, um, this has really taken off. So we actually worked with um, NYU Stern School and and assessed our uh, resale partnership with ThreadUp, um, which we launched in 2017, 2018. Um, and made that publicly available. We basically showed them the balance sheet and said, if you want to be thinking about really the business case or the return on investment of programs like this, here's here's a case study. Um, so that's all that's all available online. Um, I'm sure we can drop the link in or find it. Um, and that is really uh, meant to show that if you offer these incentives, you know, gift cards, whatever promo promo codes, 
you actually are um, retaining customers. You're getting more loyal customers and, and, and they're more likely to come back and, and stay with the brand and shopping with the brand. Um, so from a pure sustainability perspective, some people uh, find that not problematic, maybe problematic is the right word, right? You know, you're, you're having them do these behaviors that are more sustainable, um, but then you're also incentivizing them to keep shopping by something new. Um, but from a business case perspective, that's where it starts to pencil, right? So that's why I think resale again has become this really prolific program you see brands uh, promoting because it's sort of this true win-win. Um, you're facilitating a, a more responsible behavior, um, but there, there's the business case to back it up. So I think for brands that are earlier in trying to do the same thing with recycling, that's where the incentive comes into play. How do you convince someone to do something that's frankly not very convenient? Uh, you know, having to find the drop-off location or print the label and, and manage it like an e-commerce return um, instead of dropping it into something that's less tra traceable or trackable, whether that again is going into some of the existing mechanisms like a Goodwill or, or trashing it. Um, and then again, you can potentially see some retention um, gains from, from offering an incentive. Um, we do offer incentives to recycle through our ref recycling program. We're really relatively early um, in that process. We just launched that in March of this year. Um, but one of the things we've said is that we'll, we'll be pretty open again, similar to what we did with our resale program of actually publishing the results. What are we seeing? What's the quality and health of a program like this? Because we want other brands to learn kind of through, through these, these um, case studies and see if this is something we'd actually want to scale and replicate or not. Um, so I would say, again, this is still a little bit untested, uh, on the, on the recycling side. Um, a lot of the partners that we work with send really rosy, you know, uh, economic models. And I would, I would definitely approach those with a little bit of skepticism. Um, but if you're going to be doing it anyways, you just say, this is a brand mandate. We want to take that product responsibility. We want to be a facilitator in this process. Um, it's worth testing to see again if it ends up actually um, having a, a, a more conventional business case as well. So one thing that we haven't really mentioned during this whole conversation is the urgency, you know, climate, climate crisis. And, you know, common knowledge or, you know, information tells us we need to reverse or at least come to a stance uh, like neutral place within five years um, or we're really, there's no hope. And so, um, okay, Karen has posted the um, Airtable feedback link in the chat. We hope everybody um, takes notice and fills that out. It's very brief. Um, but I'm, so we're talking today about a lot of pilot programs. We're talking about testing. We're talking about the need to build, a, like to ramp up the system, make connections. We're hoping that the chat today uh, has built some connections. People are taking notice of each other. There's a lot of rich information in this chat. So anybody who wants to save it, I encourage you to do that. But I wonder if, you know, maybe your final comments here could be about how do we, how do we really ramp this up? How do we accelerate this work and create a a solid business case for whatever business, wherever the person is in the system, whether it's a sorter, a collector, an innovator, you know, repair house, a brand, et cetera. What is it gonna to take to light that fire? That's a good question. <laughs> I'm sorry to end with such a tough one. You know, I would say, I, I've always said, you know, what is it gonna take to light the fiber? Um, you know, I hope um, that the fire is already lit is what I would say, because, you know, we all just have to open our eyes all over the world to know that we're in that situation, right? We're in a situation where we need to move. And, you know, people talk about collaboration. We feel very strongly. I think today was really wonderful with people sharing information. You need to share information about real things that have happened, right? Not a pat on the back because something looks good, but really, you know, I like Kathleen, if you're talking about, hey, you know, we're showing you, you know, what the bottom line looks like, right? How does this work? Does it not work? And then I think you have to absolutely do those things that are possible today. There is a lot that is possible today. Um, those collaborations are incredibly important so that you know um, what is possible, what are the things that can be done. 
Um, and without your eyes and ears open and your participation with other people, you won't know that. So collaboration is at the base of it. We are all interconnected, um, just like we think of the world and you know, our, all the pieces of it, our air, our water, everything is interconnected and we are a part of that, right? And so we really got to collaborate, use what works, learn from other people who have actual experience and um, more than just passion. Anyone else want to throw something in? I would say alongside that is trust needs to be uh, trusting data, trusting brands, trusting, um, you know, uh, you know, and kind of so cons cons consumers aren't worried about being greenwashed, you know, and it's the same thing you find in the aid aid, you know, aid, um, you know, uh network so many people want to give but they're so worried that they're going to give to the wrong charity and then their money's not going to end up where they want it to be right on the ground really helping people and it stops people from giving because of this fear of who and where and this unknown of what is the right road forward um so i think having um uh yeah good reliable sources of organizations that can be a good reference for the industry and also for consumers to know what is greenwashing and what is not greenwashing is hugely important because essentially without that motivation for the people and the education and the trust there we won't be motivated to change the way in which we you know buy and use products effectively I think that's so powerful. And I agree with Carla. I think the why is there. So I mean, the, 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 the fire is hopefully started. And I think what still is, is less tested and less known is the exact how, you know, we're talking about some of these things that, that are um, in, in process, things that seem to be um, directionally right. Um, and I think it's giving ourselves the, the the permission, and I think some of this comes back to Nin's point on on trust is giving ourselves the permission to to go for it and to try and be open to to learning mm -hmm. and failing along the way, and um, in investing in what we know now is the future of fashion. Um, and so, I think something I'm I'm really excited about, something that um, makes me hopeful. I, I think if you work in sustainability, you're probably naturally an optimist. So I have that going for me, but um, I, I, I feel like we're starting to coalesce, you know, around some of these, these key, uh, these key problem statements and these, these key solution sets and feels like, you know, we're, we're, we're definitely miles ahead of where we, we were when I started in, in, in my role nearly a decade ago. And um, I, I can't wait, let's, let's do this. Um, and uh you know, again, it's not going to be pretty. It's still some messes to clean up along the way, but I, I think uh, I think we 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 have to give ourselves permission to just start at the start at the the, the beginning of this race and, and and go for it. That this. is the best way to end this. Um, hope, try it. It's messy. I love it. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna. Um, I'm going to have to wrap it up now, although I feel like we could all go get lunch together and just keep talking, all of us, including the attendees. Um, there's so much more to talk about, but I just want to thank you, um, Kathleen, Nin, and Carla. Uh, thank you each for your amazing participation, your honesty, um, and remind everybody who's watching to take a moment to um, respond to the feedback form if you haven't done it already. And then to join us for our next panel discussion, which is next week, same time, um, Tuesday, November 8th, on the topic of circulating synthetics and where will all that polyester go? So um, we really want to uh, encourage you to stay connected online via the Hay Fashion website and through any connections you made here today um, and our social media. And if you haven't already, please do download the Hay Fashion Report, which is on the Hay Fashion website, hayfashion.org, um, for a deeper dive into this content. So thank you again, and we hope to see you all next week.